All right. So we read John 5, 9 yesterday, but we really didn't talk about it. And it's a great segue into where we're going today. So John 5, 9 says, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bell and walked in response to the being by the pool of Bethesda, Jesus coming to the man, asking him if he wants to be made well, and then telling him to rise, take up your bed and walk. And if you didn't hear that message, go back and listen. It's just such a beautiful text to break down. But then it says, and that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now, I'll tell you what. The Jews had originally 613 Levitical laws. Those are the laws you find in the book of Leviticus and also in Numbers and Deuteronomy. These are the laws given to Moses and clarifications and breakdowns of those laws. Now, the Jews then took those and made like a commentary on them, explaining what those laws meant. And then they made commentaries on the commentaries. And so you run into all these different things where they started to really nitpick the little details. And by the time of Jesus, a woman was not allowed to look in a mirror on the Sabbath because she might see a gray hair. And if she was tempted to pluck that gray hair, it would be considered harvesting, which is illegal on the Sabbath. Or we find things like you can't spit on the dirt in the Sabbath because the water will roll and it's considered like plowing or whatnot because it picks up dirt and moves the dirt around. But you could spit on a rock. There's all these crazy Sabbath rules that the Jews used to follow. And you know what's sad is that today, we find churches making up similar rules. At the end of the day, we have to understand the Bible is our authority on what's sin. And we can't make up our own rules. Now, some stuff might be wisdom, but again, we can't get what the Pharisees had happened. They became legalistic. I've had arguments and discussions with people. Can Christians dance? Can Christians see a rated R movie? Are we allowed to wear hats in church? Some of these things can be super controversial and people get big arguments. And so we then have to then do our own Pharisee thing when we break it down. Well, this one's okay and that one's not okay. At the end of the day, we need to do what Romans tells us, which is to walk in the spirit. There is no condemnation to those who walk according to the spirit. And so we need to trust the Lord. We need to read our Bibles and let the Holy Spirit guide us and lead us. And I will tell you something, is that if you seek the Lord and you grow nearer to him, as you get closer to inapproachable light, a holy God, you're gonna find God convict you of things that he doesn't convict your friends of. And in Romans 14, it tells us that to do anything without faith is sin. The idea being is if I can't do things and live my life with faith, then it's a sinful thing for me to do. If you, you cannot dance without feeling convicted, then maybe God doesn't want you to dance. God knows I can't dance, so I have no conviction when I get my groove on. And that's the idea. If you think that you're never allowed to watch a rated R movie, that's a good conviction that you should stick with. But the passion of the Christ is also rated R because the crucifixion of Jesus was quite gruesome. And so there's an exception. So I don't make a hard rule, but I'll tell you what, probably most rated R movies aren't worth us watching. So all these rules and laws, they came up with a rule you cannot carry your bed because you're lifting a load and you're doing a burden. So back to John 5, he's carrying his bed. The Jews say to him, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. John 5, 11, he answers and said, well, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, well, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place, 
pool of the Bethesda was packed. There was a lot of people there. And so Jesus slipped into the crowd. He didn't know. But afterwards, verse 14, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. I think we need to take a moment and just really wrap our brains around what Jesus just said there. This man could not walk. He was lame. And there was no welfare system back then, right? I mean, he was dependent on begging. There was no place to shower. There was no place to anything. He lived a, an awful life. A life worse than probably most, most any American experiences. And so here's this man, 38 years, cannot walk. He's healed. And Jesus says, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you and it's the reminder at the end of the day Jesus is not there and guys bear with me okay at the end of the day Jesus is not here to save your marriage and he's not here to save your your finances and your mortgage at the end of the day Jesus is not here to cure cancer yet he would love to do all those things but at the end of the day, he came to save your soul. At the end of the day, it's eternity that truly matters. And Jesus is the one who says, better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with both. Better to go to heaven with one hand than to go to hell with both. And so he's telling this man, hey, I just dealt with a huge physical need of yours. But remember, that physical need was not the greatest need you had. The greatest need you had was the payment for your sins. And so that's just an emphasis we need to remember sometimes is that I see a lot of churches doing good things and we all ought to do good things. And James, Jesus' brother, makes it super clear, right? It is unchristian-like to say, go and be filled when there's people who are needy and we're not helping them, right? It is unchristian of us to ignore the physical needs of people. Yet on the flip side, too many churches, I fear, get so caught up in the food drives, which are good, and the building houses for the poor, which is good, and clothing drives, which is good. But these things, if this becomes the purpose of our church, Instead of saving lost souls, we are missing the point. Jesus tells the man whom he heals from 38 years of being paralyzed, sin no more, lest a worst thing come upon you. And so this is a big deal. And it's just something we need to wrap our heads around and get in our minds. Now, let's go a few more verses. We got a little bit more time today. And so in verse 16 now, it says, For this reason, so the, the Jews now know that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. The Jews persecuted Jesus, and they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. I know people who deny the deity of Christ, the belief that Jesus is God. The thing is, is that the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying. When he talks about my father, that was a saying, my father, not just our father, but when Jesus speaks of it personally, my father, he was making himself equal to be God. And Philippians chapter 2 tells us he didn't consider it robbery, i.e. Jesus didn't consider it improper or wrong to consider himself God's equal. Now, a man indwelt with the Holy Spirit is not God's equal. An angel made flesh is not God's equal, right? I mean, does this make sense? If you're a human and you have a baby, your baby's a human. If you're a parrot 
and you lay an egg and it hatches, you're gonna hatch a parrot. If you're a dog and you have a baby, it's gonna be a dog. If you are God Almighty and you have a son, it can be nothing else than God. That's the idea, is that my father, he was making himself equal with God. Again, Colossians says that Jesus made everything and that all things were made for Jesus. I and my father are one. We're unified together, a oneness, not just like-minded, but literally one being. And this doctrine of the Trinity, it should blow your mind. If you're a Christian and you still feel like, yeah, the more I think about it, it is a little confusing, that's okay. Because if you try and fit Almighty God into your little head, we shouldn't be able to fully comprehend an infinite God in a finite brain. That makes sense, right? Your knowledge is limited. Your processing, like a computer processor, it can only go so hard and so fast. We'll never fully comprehend an infinite God. But we can know a lot about him through his word. We can know more than enough to save our souls and to get us through this life with as many blessings and heavenly rewards as possible. And so, ah, do I even keep going? No, I'm going to pause because there's more stuff as he continues this discourse on down into chapter 6. So tomorrow we'll carry on this discourse and by the end of the week we'll make it into chapter 6 and it's exciting. Love this text. Love you guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Click the share button and let other people learn the Bible side by side with us. Take care, guys. Bye.